Okay, here's a video you won't see anywhere else on any YouTube photography channel. I'm going to answer a lot of questions here with a very simple explanation and demonstration. Uh, how are we able to uh, keep decent lighting while drastically increasing the megapixels on a new iteration of camera, like a D850 versus a D810, or let's say the 100 megapixel GFX versus the 50 megapixel GFX? or the X-T2 versus the X-T3. Same thing in cars. If you make a car faster, you gotta make it a lot lighter, right? Um, like they start making hoods out of aluminum and they uh, use uh, injection molded ultra lightweight magnesium for the engine instead of aluminum. I mean, aluminum is lightweight enough. It's like, yeah, we want the car to be faster. We gotta cut ounces off of it, right? For me to get faster, I gotta lose weight, right? So everything's a trade-off. So if we're going to go from a moderate megapixel camera, whether it be the X-T2 or the GFX or the Nikon D810, and we're gonna drastically bump up the megapixels with more eyeballs on the sensor, what do we gotta do? Everything in exposure is gain and time and native SNR. Obviously gain and time is aperture and shutter speed. So the other thing we can work with on the actual design of the sensor is increasing the native SNR or signal to noise ratio, right? So if we're going to bump up the SNR, which we necessarily must do with the uh, BSI sensor, backside illuminated sensor versus the conventional sensor. And as you saw yesterday, I gave you a demonstration between the uh, conventional sensor and the uh, BSI sensor the actual infrastructure of the wiring layer has been brought to the bottom. This is uh, not the wiring layer, but these are the photoreceptors at the bottom of a conventional sensor. So a lot of this light, not a lot, but about a stop and a third, I'll say a lot. Ultimately, it's a lot. Stop and a third is quite a lot of light. Is lost in the side of the well, right? But on a BSI sensor, these colored things right here, the color filter array, which of course is on any sensor unless you want a monochrome sensor, right? So we actually have changed the photoreceptors up here. We've actually moved the wiring harness to the bottom where it exists in the well on a conventional sensor. So we brought that to the bottom on a backside illuminated sensor. We've also increased uh, signal transmission by using a copper wiring harness. That has something to do with the actual innovation of the technology used to create a BSI sensor versus that of a conventional sensor. It's extremely complicated. I don't even pretend to know more than half of it. But since we have our photoreceptors up here at top, we have better native gain, right? Our photoreceptors are up here versus down here in a conventional sensor. A conventional, of course, would be like DA10, GFX, X-T2. Right? So we're going to go from this number of eyeballs or megapixels to a lot more eyeballs or more megapixels. Well, there's a trade off there. Now we've actually gone from photosite receptors like this, this would be two photosite receptors right here, to this, relatively speaking, right? We've gone from these huge photosite receptors to tiny ones on our higher megapixel camera, in the case of our X-T3, which isn't drastic, gone from a 24 to a 26 megapixel. However, right here it's a 28 megapixel that's downsampled to 26, since apparently it might be a Samsung sensor. Also, too, same sensor on the GFX 100S, size-wise, as the GFX 50S, but we've gone from 50 megapixels to double that to 100. So we've gone from uh, decent sized eyeballs or photo sites in the GFX 50S to much smaller, right? Same thing in the case of the Nikon D810. Nikon D810 is uh, 36 megapixels and the Nikon D850 is 45 megapixels. We'll talk about this set over here in a second. So what can we do? We have to do a uh, important thing on our BSI sensor. What we actually have to do that's so important is we have to increase the signal to noise ratio because we've also bumped up the megapixels. If we're going to bump up the megapixels over here, we're going to make, in this analogy, the uh, sensor faster. You know, we have to actually trim off some weight. We have to make it more efficient. So we have to increase the signal to noise ratio because of the tiny photo sites on the new BSI sensor. A BSI sensor natively, as you can see up here in red, depending on, there's a lot of things that actually affect this because the camera is on the sensor. We have 80 converters and SNR firmware. We actually have signal processing. 
the same thing with the Nikon D600 versus the Nikon D610 versus the Nikon D750, right? Those cameras were separated by a lot of years. All three of those cameras are using the exact same sensor. But our BSI sensor has better native SNR by a stop and a third to two stops. Okay, so this is how we're able to get around that. People say, well, you know, it's reported the output of the X-T3 is roughly the same as that of the X-T2. What we've done is we've done a trade-off. It's still a little bit better. It's certainly only a stop better from all reports and all indications, but we've, we've only added, gone from 24 to 26 megapixels, right? So that's no drastic change. But it still has better native SNR. This is a trade-off. You're going to add more eyeballs. You're going to have to make those eyeballs smaller, right? It's going to be on the same size. How do you fit like twice as many people in the same... How do you fit twice as many clowns inside of a clown car? Well, apparently all the clowns are going to have to lose weight. They're going to have to get skinnier, right? Right. So we have worse native... Um, have, excuse me, have a higher megapixel count. We're going to have to... Uh, offset that with a better native SNR. Now let's take a look at the pixel pitch of a couple different cameras here for comparison to show you. The GFX 50 megapixel camera is 5.31 micrometer pixel pitch. On the new 100, which is a Sony sensor, which is currently being used by Phase 1, we know what sensor the GFX 100S is going to get. It is 3.76 micrometer. Okay. 5.31 versus 3.76. That's not half, but it's pretty drastic. So both, both the same camera, basically. Obviously, both the same sensor size. But we've shrunk the eyeballs down from this to this. The way to offset that with still having the same uh, good dynamic range is we're going to have to obviously use a BSI sensor and the new GFX 100S it's called the IMX 141 I believe is the sensor designation it is a, -da -da, a BSI sensor all of these cameras here XT3 uh, GFX 100S and Nikon D850 are backside illuminated sensors so we're going to add cram well, in the case of the Nikon D850 okay here's a really drastic example Nikon D810 36 megapixels. Nikon D850, 45 megapixels. That's, that's quite a jump. The uh, pixel pitch on the Nikon D810 sensor is 4.8 micrometers. And the pixel pitch on the Nikon D850 doesn't sound that drastic, but it's significant, is 4.34 micrometers. So we've gone from 4.8 to 4.34 micrometers, which is a difference of difference of um, 0 0.53 micrometer which is a 12 percent okay so the eyeballs on the Nikon D850 are 12 percent smaller which of course don't gather as much light you know those nocturnal animals that have the huge honking eyeballs you know they gather light really well well if you're gonna make the eyeballs smaller and yet still more efficient, depending on design, you're going to have to offset that with something. And that offset something is a BSI sensor with superior SNR, signal-to-noise ratio, because the infrastructure is much more, the big E, much more efficient on the BSI sensor. Ta-da! Much more efficient. I think that should explain it to you, the difference between a conventional sensor conventional CMOS, and a BSI. And here's three perfect examples. X-T2 versus X-T3, the GFX50S versus GFX100 megapixel, Nikon D810 versus the Nikon D850. We're going to cram a lot more megapixels on the same size sensor. We're going to have to offset that because the eyeballs are going from this to this. And that offset correction is SNR using BSI sensor technology. Absolutely. This is the short and sweet explanation of that. Now let's take a look at uh, something over here, and this explains a lot. Now, this is a crude representation of the Nikon D3 D4 sensor with huge, huge, huge honking eyeballs on it. Now the question becomes, is well, why is the Nikon D3 so crappy in like really low light? You know, it's got huge, huge eyeballs on it. There's two reasons for that. 
there's actually three. One is inferior image processing, that's 80 converters and the actual main board processing of the image. And importantly, is inferior efficiency. You remember, I don't know if you remember, that back in the early days of hard drives, the hard drives were enormous, enormous, like huge, like as big as a Volkswagen. You, you ever seen pictures of that? Type in old hard drive. And they're collector's items. They're huge, but they only held like 50 uh, uh, megabytes of uh, information. <laughs> it's like a, a hard drive as large as your car and yet only held 50 megabytes. Now we have tiny, tiny, tiny hard drives, which, uh, you know, holding terabytes and terabytes of information, right? So this perfect analogy between Nikon D3. It has huge, huge eyeballs on the Nikon D3, D4. Now, why is the D4 so good? Because the Nikon D4 has radically, it's quite a separation because we had D3, D3S, D3X, and then boom, out came Nikon D4. Nikon D4 has drastically improved efficiency and image processing, yet, this is the secret, by the way, of the Nikon D4. The Nikon D4 has radically improved, it's still inferior to what we have today, radically improved processing, radically improved efficiency, and yet still has huge 16 megapixel camera. Huge, a honking eyeballs on the sensor. Yes, indeed. Now let's take a quick look at, uh, we're looking at two photo sites or two photo wells down here. S stands for shadows, H stands for highlights, right? So here we have huge, and this is why on dynamic range, Nikon D4 beats out modern cameras. Here we have uh, shadows and highlights, right? Here we have two photo sites, right? Or two, so we have a green filter here. We're not going to re represent three of them. We're just going to say green and blue, right? Close enough, since it's a color, has a, a CFA, color filter array on it. Dynamic range. Dynamic range. Now, we're going to take two shots with uh, two cameras, a modern camera with tiny, tiny little pixel pictures on it, and this have a Nikon D4 here, and just camera X, a modern camera X of some kind right here. Right, so our highlight fills, we both have the exact same amount of light between these two cameras. Same lens, same light, same, well, different exposure, but the exact same amount of light. So our, uh, and this is where the water analogy comes in. It applies not to sensor itself, but to the photo sites. Our highlights fill up with uh, about this much water. Really, this is why ETTR is important, so you don't actually max it out. Okay, this is our highlight, and our shadow is going to be... Oh, like right down here. So we've actually got quite a lot of information of recoverable detail in our shadows. Now the same amount of light can't do that. It'll actually clip our highlights because it'll overfill and then everything, all our highlights will be blown. What we actually do, if we fill up our highlights to right here, then our shadows are like right down here because we've already reached the clipping point. We don't want to clip out our highlights on our like say 24, let's say 35 megapixel camera here, right? And this is a 16 megapixel Nikon D4. So we have this amount of information in our shadows uh, on our modern camera. We have this amount of information with the superior SNR on our shadows of our old Nikon D4. There's a lot of information to recover there in our shadows. There's almost none over here. This is why the Nikon D4, the Nikon D4 should be called the Nikon DR because the dynamic range is the epic titties. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I mean, it's a a absolutely awesome. Absolutely awesome because you, man, you really got to work hard on a Nikon D4 to clip the highlights. Yeah, there we do. Uh -huh. Now, here's the magic secret. Here's the secret and the question you're not answering, well, maybe some of you have, is like, well, you know, I really, even back in the day, it only needed like uh, 16 megapixels right here, like on an Nikon D4. Why don't we make a modern camera with huge eyeballs on it like this, with a super superior processing and super superior efficiency, and it would be a dynamic range, uh, like it would be like a supermodel, the combination of like three of the hottest supermodels, it would just like, now you wouldn't have a lot of croppability because it'd be a low megapixel camera. Well, relatively low. I mean, if you frame your shot right, you don't need more than 16 megapixels. Let's just be honest. You just don't. 99% of you don't. 
So we actually included modern day technology with incredible efficiency, incredible processing, and huge ass eyeballs on the sensor. We would have a camera that would just like ha, 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 melt your crotch. It would be so awesome. But the reason why we don't, here's the secret. The reason why we don't is because of uh, something I call a CN. Camera nerds, button pushes. But, oh my god, it's 2018 and Nikon or whatever company came out with a 16. Hey man, let's get with the times, girlfriend. Man, man, Nikon just rolled out a 16 megapixel camera. Lame, lame. And I'd be like, no, 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 this camera's got dynamic range out the yin yang, out the pee pee. This is the, the hot crotch supermodel. Awesome. And but all the camera nerds, the button pushers, <clears throat> Sony fanboys, actually, it'd be Sony fanboys. The Sony fanboys, but, oh my god, my Sony's got 45 megapixels and Nikon or whoever rolled out a 16 megapixel camera. Ah, that sucks. Ah. <laughs> the reason why no camera company is making a super awesome beast like this, just imagine a modernized Nikon D4. It's only 16, let's say 20 megapixels, right? 20 megapixels. <clears throat> Everybody, all the camera nerds, I mean, ah, that's not enough. That's no good. No one's going to buy that low megapixel camera. He's like, yeah, but it's a full frame sensor with huge eyeballs on it. And it's got dynamic range out the PP, out the PP, out the yin yang, out the, uh, out the hoo-ha. But camera nerds are scumbags and that's why none of these camera companies will do that but it would be a really really awesome camera yes it would be but nobody would buy it because 99 percent of people are not photographers they're camera nerds you know camera nerds thank you so much for watching i hope you like this video if you do please click the link below drop a buck or two tell me to jump off a cliff or mail me one of your stinky turds because i'm sure that's what a lot of people would like to do you know at least a small handful of people. I hate that guy, that fat, bald, tattooed asshole. He sucks. I hate him. He's so irritating. I learn a lot of stuff from him, but I hate him. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> anyway, this is the trade-off between a backside illuminated sensor and a conventional sensor. And that's how that works. If you're going to stick a lot more eyeballs on the sensor, you have to offset that decrease in dynamic range and native SNR by increasing the SNR with BSI sensor technology. Yeah, that's a trade-off, right? If we're going to make the car faster, we got to make it lighter. If we're going to stick more megapixels on the same size sensor, then we have to improve the native signal-to-noise ratio. And the way we do that is, ha-ha-ha-ha, <laughs> backside illuminated sensor technology. Repeat the word after me. It technology! Technology! Yeah. Peace out, Girl Scout. Mic drop. Mic drop. Where's my mic at? There we go.